This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, welcome to the State of Clean Energy. I'm Maria Tome, and with me I have Roger Martin from The Bus. It's Energy Wednesday, and we're going to talk about not only the energy sources powering our buses, but also how the buses are part of a larger energy efficient uh, transportation system here in Hawaii, specifically on Oahu today. So, um, Roger Morton, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I know you have a lot of stuff going on and a lot of um, exciting developments, both technology-wise and in the planning stages. Yeah, we, we have a lot going on now. Of course, we have uh, our biggest uh, project on the island is, is rail, uh, and a lot of my staff are uh, planning on how we can provide the best service when we start operating rail, hopefully in 2020 interim, maybe 2021, and then uh, in later when we extend it to, to Ala Moana Center. So that probably takes up a lot of my time is thinking about that, but sort of related to that is how we're going to, what type of uh, vehicles are we going to interface with rail? Uh, rail itself, as everybody knows, it's going to be an electric mode of transportation. It's going to be connected to the grid. Uh, and our political leaders have, uh, our, both our governor, our city council, and our mayor have committed to uh, finding a way that we can start transforming our public fleets into uh, electric fleets as well. And that's something that even today we were talking to some of our partners. We have a federal grant that allow us to get our first vehicles uh, that way through the federal grant. Uh, and we're well down that road of trying to plan out. And the more that we uh, dig into this, the more uh, we understand how awesome and how complicated and how many uh, issues there are. Uh, I like to tell my staff the easiest thing we could do is to buy electric buses because they're now commercially available. They're they're proven, they work, but we got to have an infrastructure also that goes along with that, and that's a little bit that's more challenging than even just getting electric buses. Yeah, yeah. So you're, um, I guess, uh, next month um, you're on the high tech side. You know the new short term news because your your buses won't arrive for for a little while. So we can talk about that. Sure. Uh, we, well, I mean, we've, we have been testing a couple of electric buses. Uh, we had uh, a Proterra bus here a couple of months ago, and we just stopped, and we did about a month-long test of that. We sent it all over the island uh, to see wh how, how it could perform in, in all of our environments, all of our duty cycles. Uh, and that, that's a company that comes out of California uh, that's uh, from uh, basically from uh, Silicon Valley is where its roots are. Uh, and then this last month, we just stopped the test of a, of a bus that's uh, made by a company called BYD, initial stand for Build Your Dreams. Uh, and that is, that parent company is a Chinese company uh, that is, among other things, it's the largest battery company in the world. 10% uh, of the company is owned by Warren Buffett. Uh, and so it, it is a real going concern. It has more experience in electric buses than any other company on the globe. Uh, it's interesting in China, in Shenzhen, uh, BYD runs 16,000 electric buses. Uh, that's a tremendous accomplishment that they've been able to do over the last five years, just to show the speed at which uh, these kind of mega projects can unfold if there is the political will and the funding for them. Yeah. So, and we're going to, um, so those buses have left Oahu, they've left the island? No, I think uh, uh, they're going to go on to a different test. Not sure where they are right okay. now. I know they were going to be uh, transiting around to some of the neighbor islands. And then there is a, a DOT test at the airport to test out a variety of different types of, um, of buses. I think they're testing a fuel cell bus, a natural gas bus, and an electric bus to see what could be the next uh, generation of uh, rent -a car buses. Oh. Uh, there is a central rent a car facility that's under construction buses. now and it's going to mean that uh, many many of the of the private rental car buses are going to be consolidated into uh, a, a single bus line at the airport and they're looking at different technologies to determine what is the best for the airport environment yeah interesting so and you mentioned before that you have a grant to support the arrival of um, some bus a bus some buses for uh, for your fleet and your i guess you're designing 
the well, voting system or figuring out what uh, how, how they'll get their juice? Yeah, we, we have, uh, and we're pretty far along on it. We got a grant uh, about seven, eight months ago. Uh, and the grant is called a low-no grant. It's a federal FDA grant. That, and the purpose of the grant is to basically get local transit authorities familiar with electric buses. So we were successful in getting uh, a grant. Uh, and our partners, and we have a bunch of partners in that grant, uh, there is the city and county of Honolulu. They are the main proponent. There is us at Oahu Transit Services. We're the operator. Uh, we also have a relationship with Hawaiian Electric, who's uh, uh, stepped up and is helping us with some of the infrastructure planning uh, and some of the in-kind support that they're going to provide to us. Our partner developing the bus is a company called Gillick, which is in uh, Hayward, California, and they are the largest manufacturer of our bus fleets that we have. And then a, uh, another partner is the Cummins Corporation. Cummins is a large engine company. They're on the Fortune 500, uh, the largest engine company, I think, in the world. Uh, and they have, uh, they're going to be developing an electric drive system for Gillick. Uh, for, uh, and it will be, we'll be about one of, one of about three different places in the U.S. that, that will demonstrate this new uh, technology. And then finally, we have a partner in Atlanta, uh, a, a nonprofit entity called the Center for Transportation Energy that helps us, that is familiar and has done this around the country uh, and ha helps us with the modeling and uh, other things that go along with trying to figure out where, how we can operate uh, these electric buses and where's the best place to start. Yeah, thanks. Um, but, it, you know, electric buses uh, are going to be a uh, long-term issue for the island. Uh, there are lots and lots of considerations on the on uh, where we will operate these in the long term. What what routes? Uh, where we would how we, how would we power them? How would we get enough Hawaiian Electric power to all the places? Uh, because the amount of power on a bus is is huge. If if we powered up all of our buses, all 550 of our buses, and we had electric power on them, that'd be about the same storage uh, that the uh, Island of Kauai has. So it just gives you an idea of what a huge undertaking it is to transition to an all electric bus fleet. Yeah. So are you considering what time of day they would be charged and are you considering what energy sources are available at that time for it, use? Yeah, and that and that's actually one of the things that FTA liked about our grant. Uh, in Hawaii, we are actually unique in the United States. Uh, because we, we have such a high percentage of solar power. Uh, we also have a, a, a lot of uh, wind power and more every year. Uh, and so most places over on the mainland uh, would get their cheapest electric rates overnight, uh, what they would call the off-peak period. Uh, but in Hawaii, because of our tremendous amount of solar power, Hawaiian Electric is offering time of day rates for uh, EVs, for cars and things like that, with the lowest rate being midday, uh, between uh, 8 and 5 p.m. And so the challenge for us, uh, or the opportunity for us, and there are both challenges and opportunities, is to figure out uh, an operational strategy where we can shift our energizing part of our day so we can take advantage, first and foremost, of that midday period. Secondary, take advantage of the real off-peak area, which is after 10 p.m., and totally avoid adding more demand during the peak periods, which would be like between 5 and 10 p.m. Uh, and the rates will be incentivized so that we're, uh, so we're incentivized to do that. But it's also, it helps, it helps the state meet its clean energy goals uh, as uh, so that we can we can shift demand to a to a period when we have abundant renewable energy available. That's yeah. our that's our goal. Yeah, interesting. So if you're charging it during the day, is that well, like when the bus is stopped at a station or? Um, oh, it's interesting it? because when you plot our uh, peak demand, and we have peaks too, uh, we peak in the morning when people are going to work, yeah. and we peak in the afternoon when people are going home, and in the middle. Uh, you know, we, we get a, a little lull in our in our service, so we go from uh, about 450 buses at our peak times, uh, with maybe 300 buses at our off peak time in the middle. 
So uh, we can use that, and that kind of almost, not quite, but it kind of mimics the way electric utilities have their peaking too. Yeah. So when, uh, you know, during our peak, we want all of our buses on the road serving customers. Yeah. Uh, and so it's a, it, it doesn't quite exactly coincide, but we, I think we can figure out a way where we can, we can do that. We can figure out a way that, like for many of our routes, I'll give you an example of the one we're planning with our Lono grant. We have a route with three buses on it at peak times, mm -hmm. but only two buses on it in the middle of the day. So we can figure out a way that we can charge all of those buses during that middle of the day period when we have about a seven hour window when we have a, a good window for charging vehicles. Uh, that's going to be a part of the trick for us. It's going to be that it's not only going to electric, but it is really changing the way, we, the, the way that we operate, the way that we schedule our employees, uh, the way that we uh, regulate, the way we design our schedules. Mm -hmm. So all of those things change. And that's where I think the, the opportunity and the challenge comes in because I, I think through some simulations that we can figure out a way that we can make a driver's work schedule better and we can make our service more reliable and more regular uh, through this method than the, than the method we have right now of one driver on one bus. And whenever that bus gets to the end of the line, that's when we start the next one. Uh, we can do better than that. Yeah, yeah. So talk, you know, when you mentioned that you have the off peak, you know, the peak in the morning and the afternoon and during the middle of the day, I thought, well, that's, you know, that's when the buses would possibly be charging under this particular scenario. And that's when the maximum sun production right. is on sunny days at any rate. So, and even when it's not sunny, you only lose, you know, some percentage, but those solar panels are still pumping in, um, electricity into the grid or into the into the batteries. So. Yeah, and from the utilities point of view, it allows them to accept more rooftop or uh, or alternative energy into the grid yeah. uh, because they uh, and you know and to avoid um, making them increase their system size by by making the peak periods uh, more demand in the peak periods that's huge to a utility to yeah. to be able to do that uh, and we hope that they're going to recognize that too and that we'll get pretty good rates uh, yeah. from them because uh, uh, we are uh, doing something that, that uh, has a synergy between the utility model and uh, the transportation model. Yeah, and I've seen um, different designs for the, the charging. Mm. And I guess in California they have one where there's the bus stop and then if the bus is opportunity charging it has this thing on top of the bus um, that goes up and... Well, there's, t there's two uh, predominant methods now. Uh, about, you know, initially there was a lot of opportunistic charging. That's mm -hmm. where you charge the bus up after every cycle of the bus, every round trip. Uh, and the conventional is that you need six minutes of charging for every hour of operation. It uses very high capacity chargers, 450 kilowatts or in that ballpark to yeah. charge up to get that kind of, uh, of charging time. Uh, and that usually works pretty good because you know, you, you usually the drivers need to take a break at the end of the line anyway. Yeah. So if you can figure out that you get to an end of a line, the driver gets a break, the bus gets charged up, that's one model. The other model, is, and that's becoming more predominant now, is that bus manufacturers are just putting more and more and more battery capacity on the vehicles. Uh, and that allows the bus to then operate almost a full duty cycle so that the bus can yeah. go out in the morning and come back at the end of the day. Uh, now, that, that has a few costs to it. Uh, one of the costs is it costs a lot more for more batteries. Uh, another cost is that that bus weighs a lot more than it would if you didn't have as many batteries in it. Right. Uh, and that, that costs you a couple of ways. That reduces the efficiency of the, of the bus. It also probably bangs up the streets more because the vehicle is heavier. <laughs> Uh, right. And so there are, there are different ways to do it. Now, for us in Hawaii, uh, I'm a proponent of a middle ground where uh, we have enough battery capacity so that we can totally avoid those costly and expensive peak periods. They're about yeah. five hours long. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, uh, usually we would be charging up uh, after every trip, but we would have enough power that once, it, once we got to, to the high cost demand period, that we would not charge until that was over, and right. then we would we would top up the bus 
after the demand period. It's a little complicated. Uh, we've simulated it a few times. Yeah. Looks like it works, um, but it'll be a learning process for, for everybody uh, as to how uh, this is gonna work in the, in the real world. And that's why we're gonna start fairly slow, fairly yeah. small scale. Yeah. Uh, and, and learn uh, what issues that we should really be concerned about before we go uh, with uh, hundreds of buses, which is where we will go. We'll go with hundreds of buses right, ultimately. Right. Yeah. yeah, well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll hear more about the stuff that's happening with Oahu Transit Services' Roger Morton. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solution, how to make a brighter day. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host on Think Tech Hawaii of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Every other Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., I hope you'll join us as we explore the value, the accomplishments, and the challenges of education here in the Pacific Islands. Hey, welcome back. So, Roger, you were telling us about the bus, um, the electrification of your buses, and you're starting with a grant. And um, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about how that's going to um, develop and then what else do you have in your plans well um, you know as i say the co most complicated part is figuring out where we should be charging and, and where and, and the grant's going to help us do that too we have money in that but beyond the grant itself the the city council has earmarked uh, money for us to develop uh, number one develop some infrastructure at our Kalihi palama facility mm -hmm. and uh, and we're, we're starting to plan out uh, additional charging for that. And in the current budget that's under consideration uh, by the council, there's additional money that would allow us to buy more vehicles and put in more infrastructure. Uh, and there is money to help us develop a longer term plan for where all that should be. Uh, and so these are our uh, monies that our, our elected officials have, uh, have, have inserted in the budget. I, I'm just amazed at the uh, tremendous island-wide uh, you know, uh, state, city cooperation uh, on partnership on this. I mean, uh, there's the, the, everybody seems to be behind uh, this electrification uh, project, um, and so those are those are going to be. Uh, you know, we d really desperately do need a good, solid plan on how we're going to migrate it. At, for me, at least for the next four or five years, because we got to we got to figure out what buses we're going to buy, mm -hmm. what charging strategies we're going to have. And while I was talking a little bit about the opportunistic, there'll be many routes that we uh, do the other one, where yeah. we just run the bus uh, for a full schedule and then bring it back and charge it back at our at our bus facility. So mm -hmm. we need to figure out the split between what makes the most sense in one service type and what makes the most sense in another. Uh, then we, you know, there's there's a lot of disruption going on in the transit industry right now. You know, we have uh, the uh, ride hailing uh, companies. Uh, they certainly had an impact on some of our ridership. Uh, there's, uh, and, they, and you know, we need to figure out how, how do they play in this landscape. We are building uh, a metro system, a rail system that's going to connect up our western suburbs uh, with uh, Honolulu, with the downtown in Ala Moana. Uh, we need to figure out how uh, that's going to impact uh, the bus system, and it will have a large impact on the bus system. Uh, we need to figure out how we would provide, continue to provide service to places like the University of Hawaii, to Waikiki, at least initially until rail is uh, expanded uh, to serve those places directly. Yeah. So those are complicated issues. Uh, the all this, uh, you know, the ride hailing business. So how do they play in this? Uh, Biki is, is in town, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it can provide a last mile solution. Uh, can you explain just briefly the last mile for some folks who may not be familiar with the term? Well, the last mile uh, means that in, in many, tra especially on the mainland, in many transit environments, there's great transit, 
but you still, after you, you get to the closest point to where you want to be, you've got another mile to go. So you have your transit corridors and then the last mile. The last mile. At the end. Uh, yeah. You know, we use that term in Hawaii, and, yeah. and frankly, it, it, it has less resonance here because uh, our, our bus system goes so many places that <laughs> we're, very, you know, we're really seldom further than a mile away. But nonetheless, when the, when the last trip is, is, a, is a mile long, let's say rail gets to Ala Moana Center and people are going to the Ilikai, well, that's only that's less than a mile away. Mm -hmm. So there there could be uh, other modes uh, that would would uh, provide that service. We would probably provide the service too, but we need to figure out what the mix of all of those different modes makes the most sense. Maybe that mode is bicycle. Maybe it's a scooter. Who knows uh, mm -hmm. what it could be? And then we have uh, probably. Uh, a few years uh, down the road, later than that, or maybe sooner than I think, we have autonomous vehicles coming, uh, both autonomous private vehicles, uh, maybe autonomous Uber-type vehicles, uh, or maybe even autonomous bus vehicles. So uh, there's all, all of these technologies are, are coming uh, together, and they're being powered by technology, by communications, by computers, uh, but they're impacting all parts of our economy and the transit business is not immune from that. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a very exciting time for yeah. transit, as it is for many. So talking about integration of the transportation system with the communication system and mm -hmm. the economy. So right now you have bus pass. Yeah. OK. Talk to us about what that might uh, look like in the future. Well, not so far in the future, because we, we have uh, bus passes now. We have cash, mm -hmm. uh, single ride cash fares, uh, but we are transitioning to a smart card system. And that smart card system is what is known as an account-based smart card system. Uh, there was, uh, there's been a couple of, of systems that have embraced this technology so far. Chicago was uh, one of the first pioneers, uh, embraced it about two years ago. Um, TriMet in Oregon embraced the technology uh, about eight months ago. Uh, and we are going to be one of the first to use it. And the reason why it's a little different is I'll explain the architecture of how it works. Ours is an account-based system. That means that uh, all of the information about your account, your transit account, is going to be held in the server in the back office. Up until now, most of the transit smart cards have been card-based systems where the, tr the, the amount of your balance is kept right on the card. You tap it and it comes off the card. Ours, you tap it, it goes into a communication system, it comes off in a back office, and it comes. And that means that we can be much, much more flexible in the products that we offer through the smart card system. It means we can integrate with other modes a lot easier. They don't have to have uh, expensive equipment on, on it. They don't have to have uh, that. Uh, we can So conceivably, we could integrate with uh, Biki. We could integrate with rail for sure, and that's one of the driving forces is you can use your, car, your, your transit card to tap on to a gate that will open uh, and get you onto the rail system. We could uh, integrate with bike share. Uh, we could integrate conceivably with parking. Uh, so there's uh, many, many opportunities that we have. And we've, made, we've been working on this project for about four years now. Uh, and we are ready to launch our large-scale pilot in September. Oh, this year? This year. Wow. We are already, uh, almost all of our buses have the equipment installed. I think it just, maybe there's a few buses left, but by the end of this week, all the buses will have the information, and the equipment installed. Uh, we have our inside staff of contractors and some hard officials and some DTS officials out in the field now that are doing inside tests. Oh, and okay. we're gonna we're gonna be recruiting a large scale of our of our rider base uh, uh, to to participate in a in a beta test uh, that will maybe involve as many as three thousand people uh, starting and we our goal is to start that in September uh, and then our rollout for the general public and and rollout means we might it might take us two years to roll it all out two or maybe even three. But our rollout is scheduled to start around January. Now, things can go wrong, and we can extend that, but that's our current plan right now. Oh, yeah, that sounds interesting. 
Yeah, um, so, um, but you'll still take cash for the occasional we'll, rider, at least for the foreseeable future? For, for the foreseeable future, we'll take cash on the buses, mm -hmm. but rail will not take cash. Rail, mm -hmm. will re rail will have vending machines that you can convert cash and yeah. get a card, yeah. uh, but there'll be other incentives to get a card. For example, uh, uh, our, ultimately we will withdraw all of our paper products, our passes, our day passes, We've already withdrawn our transfers, our paper transfers. So all of those activities would only be allowable if you had a card. And that gives people an incentive to get a card. Mm -hmm. Now, when we start rolling this out, uh, we're going to try to flood the community with as many cards as we can. And we're going to give them away free. Oh. But after the first <laughs> period, those cards are going to be $3 a piece. So uh, I urge all of the people watching, once we start rolling these out, Find out where you can get a card and get one because the first one's going to be free. Oh, cool. Yeah. And so going along with this idea of, you know, the transportation system, the communication system, very often you want to know when the next bus is coming. Yeah. And I thought I had heard something about um, some work you guys are doing on accuracy of your bus arrival predictions. Yes, we're going to make a, an announcement. We're, we're actually doing a soft launch right now, but we're going to make an announcement next month about a partnership with a, a technology company on the mainland that will allow us to improve our predictive capabilities. We, we make predictions now we, we electronically with computers, uh, but we do it in a fairly simple way. Uh, and our partners have developed a methodology that is more complicated, that also involves looking at historical periods and, and, and mining the data. So uh, in our internal tests that we've done so far, uh, it's about 30% more accurate than our own. Now, this is like seconds difference, but it's important <laughs> to us. Yeah. Uh, and so that'll make a big difference. And then once we get our communication system with our smart cars, that will involve using a router on our buses, a cellular router, rather than a, uh, what we use now, which is a radio system. Uh, and that should allow us to get improved updates of where the bus is, maybe down to every 15 seconds. Yeah. Uh, my, my staff's goal is they want folks to be able to look at a Google map and actually see the bus moving. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. to, uh, and that's our goal is to get it that way. So those are all ambitious plans. Yeah. We've got a lot going on at the bus yeah. uh, right now. Yeah, I, we have a couple more minutes. Um, and I know your Google Maps, I just thought, you know, when that first came out, wasn't Honolulu one of the first cities to, to do that? Yeah, we were, actually. We did it in, uh, uh, there were three cities that Google reached out to to be beta testers. Yeah. There was us, there was Portland, Oregon, and there was Seattle. Uh, and uh, our folks took a, you know, one of my staff, who's now the deputy director of the transportation services for the city, uh, was one of the architects of coming up with the schema that, they, that, that we use, we all use it now globally, on how to define uh, what a transit trip looks like. That was John Nucci, who's the deputy director for the city now. Uh, and he, and you know, uh, Google Transit now, you can go to Istanbul and use Google Transit. It's global now. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm really proud that it was uh, started in the US, started in the Western states between us and Seattle and Portland. Yeah. Well, congratulations on all the good things that you've done, the successes that you've had, and your plans um, for continued success in the future. Um, did you, is there any last thing you'd like to encourage people to do? Well, I think that, you know, we, we, we've, we have a great bus system on the island. Uh, I think our, our island folks uh, have, a, have a history of, of patronizing it. We're one of the most highly utilized systems in the country. Uh, and I look forward, I tell my staff, I mean, I'm getting a little long in the tooth. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next 25 years, and I want to make sure that we get an organization that will stand the test of time and that will be able to, uh, to go for the next 25 years. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for watching. And don't forget, get your card when, what, what do they call it again? The smart? We call it the holo card. The holo card. That's our name, the holo card. Okay. When it's available, make sure you get it. And be nice to your bus drivers. And uh, you guys have a slogan for, you know, driving cooperatively. Share the road. <laughs> there you Share go. Share the road with us, there too. You go.